and a warm welcome back to all you forum fans. Very happy to have you with us, even if I cannot see you. In case you're joining this channel for the first time, my name is Katrina Sickle. I'm a moderator and broadcaster, and I have the pleasure of your and seven speakers company from now until quarter past five Central Eastern time to explore AI cities and the future of urban life in Europe. Now, the last months have seen an acceleration in trends, the fast implementation of innovative solutions to face the COVID-19 crises, most of the transformation and adaptation processes took place in cities. Here's one example. Cities found the best solutions to the health crisis were the ones that put people front and centre and also brought the physical world closer to the digital one. So the application of tech and data and AI has been crucial to manage resources and to provide better services, but of course it brings concerns. People are not sure, they feel a little bit uneasy. So we're gonna look in this session how technology specifically supports cities in handling issues like climate change, population growth, mobility, cleaner transport. We're gonna look at how AI has been part of that transformation and some of the things that we need to be thinking about. Now we've got a fabulous lineup of speakers, but we're gonna frame it with a great top lines insight into a recent Euro consumers survey. And I'm going to ask to join me now, I hope on his own, but I might get all the speakers, the very lovely Euroconsumers Group Service Manager of Statistical Surveys. His name is Marco Agnelli. So perhaps if he, and look, I've got quite a lot of our speakers here with me. So you can all, um, I'm going to join all of you very shortly and I'm going to introduce you actually as we go along because just to let all of our lovely audience know we've got fantastic um, expertise and experiences from local level we're going to hear from Portugal we're going to hear from Spain we're going to hear from Italy we've got a real plethora of important speakers we've got somebody from the Oxford Internet Institute you can wave please Jonathan Ah, oh, fabulous. Okay. And, uh, and uh, we also have a representative from Google. Now, because I haven't seen that representative, I don't know if he's on the screen yet. So uh, it could be not. In a moment, I'll come to you all. So I'm going to ask you to be very, very patient and take a bit of a breather. And I'd like to ask uh, Marco Agnelli to stay with me, if I can. Uh, because we're going to talk about this fantastic survey into consumer attitudes on a number of issues not least the use of new tech and AI-based systems in cities. So I'd like to ask you a few questions. And of course, the first is about the objectives of the survey. When it was done, when it was finished, how it was conducted, was it face-to-face, -face, okay. was it online and so on? And keep it lovely and concise because we have less yeah, time in this session. Than <laughs> Thank I you, Katrina, and good afternoon Thanks, to everyone. So mainly the, the two main objectives of the uh, survey was to identify consumer expectation, but as you said, also concern and opportunities uh, related with the implementation of new technologies uh, and artificial intelligence system in the context of cities. Then we also wanted to understand and to assess uh, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and to explore the expectation uh, for a post-pandemic era on dimensions, for instance, like working condition, mobility and city attractiveness as as well. So we uh, did a survey by collecting data through an online questionnaire and we did it in the middle of October. So the survey is, uh, is very recent. Uh, the survey was done simultaneously in Belgium, Italy, Portugal, Spain and Brazil. Uh, now we are going to speak about the results uh, of the European countries because the results for Brazil have been presented in a different session. Uh, and we interviewed in each of these country 1000 people, around 1000 people. The age was between 18 and 74, and the sample is representative for the respective national populations in terms of age, gender, region, and educational level. Fantastic. Beautifully concise. I love you already, Marco. Now, you <laughs> said that one of the objectives of the survey, you might not want to be loved, one of the objectives of the survey was to identify consumer perception about new technologies and AI for urban solutions. Just give me the top lines on what you found out from those consumers. Yeah, basically, 
people realize that AI will be more and more present in their daily lives. So when looking to people who live or work in urban areas, nowadays 11% of them feel that AI is already very present in their life. But if we are looking to three years from now, this same percentage goes to 33%. And if, you, if we look to 10 years from now, it rockets to 62%. So there is a strong, uh, how to say, uh, yeah, awareness on the fact that the AI is, uh, is there. Okay, so the statistics show that people understand that it's present, but in the light of those statistics, do they find AI useful? Yes, definitely. So that people see the, 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 the potential of, of AI. So the, the, the percentage of those who find either somewhat or very useful different implementation, implementations of AI system is almost around, always around 80%. So at the top of the ranking, and that might be useful for the, for the panel and discussion, is controlling city lighting more efficiently. It is optimizing public transportation. It is managing city traffic and it is optimizing waste collection. Then there are also other dimensions. For instance, one that I'm personally looking forward to suggesting available parking spots, but also some other things, for instance, using cameras in order to identify criminals on the street or to find missing persons, which of course poses or can pose some issues related to, to, to privacy. Indeed, and, and thank you very much for bringing that up because you have nicely um, presaged my next question. I mean, we know that people have issues around privacy. We know that it's also in relationship to the acceleration in the digital transition. So we know that the use of AI in general also people are concerned. Um, are they particularly concerned in this context? You cited one example there, but in the context of, you know, how we can find solutions in cities, is there? real concern? Yes, okay, they are, they are concerned. So basically they are welcoming the innovation of AI, but from the other side, they are also concerned about privacy protection, about the reliability of AI system, and they also demand to be better informed. I can give you some, some examples. So for instance, about four uh, people out of 10 are, are afraid that the, the, the artificial intelligence will lead to more abuse of personal data. One out of three is, concerned about the potential danger because of possible fails of the of the algorithm of the of the machines so and then on top 55 percent of them more than half want to be more informed when dealing with automatic decision making so there is concern and the other key point is that there's also a low level of trust so only 18 percent of people trust the national authorities to make an effective control over the organization and companies who apply ai uh, so this is this is a problem and then 14 percent consider the, the the actual legislation as uh, not uh, not adequate to regulate uh, to regulate a, ai so if you put them together with the fact that respondents feel poorly informed of course there is a a, a certain level of, of concern Thank you very much. I've got a couple more moments with you, some important questions. Um, and the issue of trust, I'm sure, is going to come up in this session. So yeah. thank you for uh, bringing that to the fore. COVID-19 has had a strong, not just had a strong impact on our lives, but continues to have a strong impact. So how has that been experienced, particularly by uh, people in cities, city dwellers, um, and just focus perhaps on two of the highlights I think you mentioned at the beginning, mobility and work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so indeed, uh, I mean, it's COVID-19 and a strong impact on, uh, on, on the life of cities. And yeah, for, for mobility, we ask consumers what they expect to do after, after the COVID uh, pandemic. And according to what I reported, 40% uh, of them say that we will, will, will walk more. 30% say that they will use more the bicycle. 30% say that they will use more e-scooters. And then about the public uh, transportation, I'm speaking about bus, tram, subway. Here there are some uh, uh, divergent data. So 28% of, of people, for instance, indicated they will, will use it less. Uh, this might be due, for instance, because of the fact they don't want to stay in crowded place, but also might be due because they expect uh, to be more teleworking. 
so that's not uh, that's not clear of course and then also on the on the utilization of the private car there are polarizations so there are 17 percent of people who say that they are going to use it less from the other side 13 percent they are going to use it to use it more and then for for the work uh, we all know it. I mean, it's during the, the, the pandemic, it was only 15% who were not uh, using telework, 36% starting completely from, from scratch. And what has happened? I mean, it seems to have changed the game. Eh? It's, uh, so if we ask the people whether they consider it likely that they are going to, to telework in the next three years, 71% answer yes. So this is something that we need to take into consideration. Okay. I need to wind up now, so I'd like you to shorten your response to the yeah. last question. I heard from friends, many friends during COVID decided to move out of cities. What did your survey results reveal about this? So just the statistics, please. That's all at this stage. Thank you. Yeah. So it, it's about 10%, those who think that they were very likely to move to another place in the next year. But it's important to say that contrary to your friend, the urban area still represent the most frequent choice. Okay. And also, I recognise that people, it's very important to be able to access healthcare, shops, to have high speed internet connection, indeed, and last but not indeed. least, a strong regulatory framework for all this. And we heard in the previous panel about the important role of policymakers there and regulators. Thank you. I'll be asking indeed. you back shortly. I'm going to move on to the first of a brilliant lineup of speakers. Uh, she is called Tiziana Dopido. She is City Councillor for Culture in Matera, Italy. So if we can come back to the main screen again, I can ask her to join me. Ah, no, I think she maybe cannot if she's, if she's with connection. So where is our lovely gentleman? Yes, I, I'm, 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 listening. I'm listening to you. Okay. Now, good people. Yes, hello. I'm going to have to ask you to I'm sorry, I don't have my headphones on. Time. No problem. So I'm going to give you all two to three minutes to for this first question. For you, Tiziana, City Councillor for Culture Matera Italy, you've got a very interesting um, project to tell us about in a couple of minutes, the House of Emerging Technologies project. What is it? The House of the Emerging Technologies is a project financed by the Italian Ministry of um, um, the Economic Development which is composed of six main uh, sections, uh, which are the Garden of the Emerging Technologies, uh, dealing with agriculture, environment and urban uh, green spaces. The section dealing with the 3D video capture and mixed reality, so dealing with the audiovisual sector, uh, the 3D robotics for the development of um, um, the development of tools and systems based on the Internet of Things, blockchain and quantum key distribution to secure the transmission of symmetric encryption, and another interesting section is the digital twin, which is the virtual copy of the town with all of its processes people, systems, and uh, buildings, and interactions for urban management in order to make tests in the urban context of the city to prevent mistakes and improve functionality. And the final one is the 5G applications to transportation, health system, um, entertainment, energy, and so on. Now, the goal of this is to support research and experimental projects to create startup companies to attract major uh, technological partners to promote uh, to provide sorry small and medium-sized enterprises with um, advanced technological systems as well as innovative projects uh, and to implement an integrated system for open innovation uh, at the service of citizens, researchers, and institutions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it sounds Welcome. very uh, integrated, very well thought through. 
very holistic. One yeah. quick question before I come to Bart Rosco from Ghent. Um, to what extent is the city dweller cognizant, um, aware of this particular project and involved in it? And literally just a beautifully short answer, please. If I was in your city, would I, would I know about it? If you, sorry, could you repeat that? If you were in my city? If I, yes, if I was living in your city, do I know about this project? And it's aims and am I, am I yes. involved in it? Yes, we are, we are, we are, we are carrying out multiple activities on this. Uh, and uh, uh, this is headquartered in um, downtown, so it has um, central um, headquarters. Many activities are carried out, which are open to visitors and citizens. Um, the interesting is that the, the interesting thing is that um, this uh, town, which is one, which is the third oldest town in the world, dating back to Paleolithic times, is very much attached to history, traditions, and identity. And the House of the Emerging Technologies was able to attach itself to the major uh, city's assets, which are the creative industry, uh, uh, cinema, for example, because um, my town is very popular um, in, the, in the movie sector. For, um, many movies are shot here, like, um, for example, um, the last uh, James movie series uh, film, um, No Time to Die, and tourism. So, uh, because of all, all these uh, you know, the virtual reality applications, which I was mentioning before, and many other you know activities we are carrying on together with the University of uh, Basilicata, the engineering school, and uh, the National Research Center. It is. The House of the American Technology is able to, uh, you know, mangle all of these aspects and um, attract uh, people to it. Uh, who can also uh, visit uh, the spaces which are open to, you know, citizens and tourists and work on them. I'm going to ask you to round off now, Tiziana, just because I, I want to give everyone else the chance to lay out their stall, and I sure. will do my yeah. level best to come back to you. But thank you your very comprehensive answer and it is truly interesting bart rosso our chief data officer from ghent what does a chief data officer do uh well we try to max we try to maximize the value that data generates so we look at the data we have we try to complement this with the data we gather from other sources and from there, we uh, we make this into value for the citizen, the organization, or the compliance with laws. And I'm just going to leave you in full straight. There you go. You can hear me again. Yes, because I know from moderating around this, not all data is created equal, is it not? But that's another conversation. I'd like to ask you, please, would you share just two actions or initiatives have been orchestrated in Ghent and tell me again as I asked Tiziana whether the consumer the citizen was implicated in that to the benefit of their well-being their quality of life in some of those areas that even Marco uh, raised at the beginning city lighting uh, public transport traffic waste and more thank you very much yeah well for um, waste management there's an issue we have with uh, littering. So what we did, we had a reporting system and we uh, gathered data for two years. And now we're training an AI system to make predictions. So we can anticipate better where the littering will be. So I think that's part of the cooperation part because we are using the info generated by the user and we take the, the AI solutions and predictions so we can adapt our policy accordingly. That's one example. Um, another example we did was um, with the lockdown when it was releasing a little bit, we were uh, giving 
estimations of how busy the city center was going to be. And that was a very interesting one to see how accurate is this, yes or no. But it also meant that people are anticipating more and they are gathering information before they come to the city center. So, and we were taking um, metrics from the websites to see if we could adapt little things to make it more useful. Interesting. Thank you very much. I'm going to come down. Yeah, you've got a nod there, actually, from your fellow um, speakers. Can I invite now, um, I'm going to ask a question to Jose Eduardo Marquez Mestre, who is a police intendant in Seville. Um, so you can give me a lovely wave. That would be delightful. <laughs> so we can liven up Hello. our... Hello. Okay, it's lovely to have you with us. Very important, very specific perspective when we're looking at smart cities. And um, perhaps you could just share for us in a couple of minutes, a couple of the measures that have been put in place for safety control of public festivities. I think that's something that you can bring um, specific experience on. Yes, uh, in Seville we have some public festivities which mean huge amount of people visiting the historical center of the town, especially on Eastern holidays. Note that in the south of Spain, these holidays last the whole week, not only two days. And Seville is full of religious celebrations, being an important tourist destination. City center becomes pedestrian and thousands of people need to move walking around through narrow streets, mostly full. In Spain, uh, people from Seville are quite used to getting into these agglomerations. You can imagine it is a serious security problem, even before COVID. Some years ago, we realized that no important incidents led to real panic situations, especially at night. Regarding on that security problem, we have developed an intelligent platform that is growing up every year. Main inputs for this uh, AI platform are intelligent cameras, ambient microphones, body cameras, GPS trackers, and software to analyze social networks. Actually, two kinds of cameras are available. First one concentrates on surveillance, facial recognition, and video recording. Some of them are ultra high definition. Second kind cameras merely act as sensors, as body counters, and only send data to control mass movements through streets. Biodynamic data is very useful to prevent agglomeration uh, issues. Ambient microphones are set on strategic positions. AI platform is able to recognize noise and discriminate dangers from normal situations. AI platform is real time analyzing social networks like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, etc., to detect and present useful information. So, policemen, volunteers, and security crew carry body cameras which can send videos on demand to the platform. Uh, Easter passes of the processions are equipped with GPS trackers to know real position of the processions. These brotherhood uh, processions usually are belong and we need to know situation of both start and end points. And now uh, let's talk about probably about the platform outputs. Coordination center operator, operators can play useful tools fed by uh, platform data. Dynamic maps of biodynamic movement, statistic data, real video, and energy resource positions are integrated onto a geographic information system. This way, emergency headquarters has dynamic information to properly move their resources police, medical ambulance, fire guards, etc. If needed, center coordination operators can use public address system to announce advices to people over the loudspeakers. 
official news and advices are published on city website and some social networks. This way, citizens can trust on them. Last output add to the system is a smart light system. Our most important and busy streets of processions itinerary, the smart light system is provided. Bright and colors can be managed by control center operators. When a procession arrives, lights turn yellow and low bright, like candles, to enhance the processions. And in case of emergy, emergency, emergency uh, lights turn white uh, very bright. And I think that's all. All right, thank you so very much. I'm just a quick question and then I'm going to come to Google. And again, please be as concise as possible, lovely people. I heard the words there, high def cameras, facial recognition, uh, GPS trackers, um, dynamic data, fantastic. Uh, official news, you said, updates is put out there for the public in real time on platforms. But on the side of the facial recognition and on the side of some of those other aspects, do you find that, and this is for a really short answer, do you find citizens are uneasy? You're the police, do they have a lot of things to say? Do they value this? What, where, where does it sit? Are people happy about yeah, what sorry. smart cities can bring and the technology? But do they feel a bit, a bit wary, a bit nervous? Yes, uh, we think people is very happy with the information that can uh, trust on and all the security measures that are for them, just for them. And people help us to, to lead all the movement of people, so no, no problem. I think they are, uh, they are quite happy with them. Okay, and I will ask that question to perhaps a couple of the other cities. Thank you so much for all of those examples. I'm going to call for more examples now, if I may, and turn to Ricardo Munoz Nunes, who is industry lead public sector at Google. What is that job in two sentences, please, Ricardo? Well, what actually, do you I'm do responsible in that for. Um... Sorry, I didn't get the last point. I said, what is, describe your job in two sentences. Okay, yeah, but I'm uh, responsible for local authorities to present what Google Cloud provides in order, how can this really get with their uh, policy making, how does it really uh, relate to smart city and other use cases. Could, in the light of that, could you just share perhaps a couple of examples of what you're doing, how you contribute to the beneficial use of tech in cities again to raise people's quality of life and their well-being and how would you look at that trust issue and the concerns that marco at the beginning from euro consumers raised did come out in the survey thank you very much absolutely thank you thank you katrina well the report showed quite clearly that most of the cities and their agencies i hear myself twice strange Maybe there's a technical issue because I hear myself. Ricardo, you will hear yourself. You will. It's a bit strange. We all hear ourselves. We are, we've got oh, time okay. lapse with it's Brazil. Weird. No problem. Sorry, it's a bit distracting. Okay, thank you, you then. Very Good, clear. then let me Go proceed. Ahead. Well, the report showed uh, quite clearly that most cities and their agencies know it is time to transform but they do not know how to do this and how they feel equipped to do it. They also don't know what is possible and how they should go about it. They have existing point systems that are typically disconnected from each other, making it challenging to make effective decisions that span multiple departments. They have a lot of, they have a lot of data, but have time consuming and labor intensive processes to extract insights for decision making. This is why we at Google offer our support and help for cities as Google wants to democratize AI, which means making AI easy, fast, and useful for all developers and skill sets. So everyone is able to use AI without any PhD or data scientist. 
We believe AI is a fundamental cloud technology that will eventually benefit all enterprises and cities. The capability of AI isn't in question. So it is about turning data into action. I'm going to go into the discussion in terms of trust afterwards. So let's have a look at the project area, for example. We presented at the ITS World Congress for the city of Hamburg, as we already did for Copenhagen and Amsterdam. This is a scientific project to measure, map, and also publish hyperlocal air quality data on the environmental insight explorer of Google, uh, making this data also available as an open data set. Project Airview measurements the result in hyperlocal maps of air quality in the different cities. Then we can reference our data analytics platform, which is the core powering our solution. It helps cities to consolidate, transform, store, analyze, predict, and visualize data from various sources and turn into actionable insights. We heard something uh, similar from the city of Ghent right now. As an example, you could use the platform to create digital twins of cities. We also heard this from Matera and simulate specific use cases or to predict traffic in order to leverage the usage of sustainable transportation modes, manage parking slots smartly and use video AI as a new data slot. This platform is also used by the Department of Transport in the UK. They migrated a large portion of its apps to Google Cloud and decommissioned a large chunk of on-premise infrastructure while improving the reliability resilience and security of its systems. The Department for Transport can now access a broad range of services and develop its own data intensive software and analytics systems on top of Google Cloud. Now let's switch to Norway, where public transport is a complex business. That's particularly true in urban centers such as Oslo, which has one of the most advanced transportation systems in Europe. The capital is a model for integration with metro, bus, tram, and ferry networks all over the world. This approach has also been applied across Norway, and it saw passenger numbers soar in the country prior to COVID-19, around 718,000 million passengers, sorry, 718 million passengers journeyed across Norway in 2019, a growth of nearly 40 million compared to the previous year. Now, both pre and post pandemic, there has been one particular challenge presented by Norway's transport network, how to package these diverse services, including timetabling and ticket sales, to the public. As you can see, data is a key component in order to solve these challenges. And Cloud Big Table, Cloud SQL, and Dataflow are the main Google Cloud products that Enter, for example, uses. Enter is the operator of the National Registry for All Public Transportation in Norway. It collects data from 60 public transportation operators on around 21,000 daily departures across 3,000 routes. It uses this to provide data driven sales tickets and journey planning services to transport operators or commuters alike. Entua gathers and disseminates this huge amount of data in terms of big data. It also drills deep down into this data to monitor details such as train carriage capacity, seat availability for bookings, pricing options, and whether transport options are accessible for older passengers or those with a disability. As you can see, we can help solving AI use cases in the city. Now, it came, if it comes to trust, I think um, the issue of trust comes up strongly in the survey result. You're absolutely right. Um, how is Google now taking responsibility to address this co uh, concern? The question is, how could we do this as a Google? We have a very clear idea on how I, uh, AI should help people, and therefore we have our AI principles. Like example, be socially beneficial, avoid creating or reinforce unfair, unfair bias, uh, be built and tested for safety, or be accountable to people incorporate privacy design principles or uphold high standards of scientific excellence, but made available for users that accord with only these principles. And our AI principles would not pursue applications or to those who cause or are likely to cause over or harm, or weapons or other technologies whose principal purpose of implementation is to cause or directly facilitate injury to people. So as you can see, we are looking uh, about AI, where to use it and where not to use it. To your second part of the question, uh, we try to get to a new level in terms of trust as we are providing strong sovereignty features as well as engaging local partners to add an additional layer to our public cloud, which creating a trusted partner cloud. Furthermore, we work closely with local authorities in order to explain Google and the innovative products and services we offer to billions of users. I need to you ask you something? to write no, I need to ask you to round off because I have two further speakers to hear from and I cannot go beyond 5.15.
but those top Absolutely. lines were fascinating and this is really the purpose of this is just to scratch the surface and i hope people will contact all of you because so much interesting stuff is coming out i think that our gentleman should from ghent should get in touch with you because i think there's a meeting of minds between local authorities data and all of those issues let me tell you what i'm Absolutely. going to do in the time we have left i want to hear from carlos i definitely want to hear from jonathan i'm going to ask each of you then for one thing you think that AI is most important from, not AI, but tech in cities, something we've already had, waste or lighting, or something that should be coming next. One thing, and then I'm gonna ask Marco for a last roundup. So thank you very much. Sorry to cut you there, Ricardo, but I'd like no to problem. invite Carlos Lobo, who is law professor at Lisbon University Law School in Portugal, and also founding partner at a, a Lobo Vasquez and Associados. He has a very extensive experience. So I've sort of decided to distill this into his views on cities as networks. How would you describe the power of the citizen, the consumer? We've heard of this throughout, the empowered consumer, more and more savvy, more and more rightly demanding. And what one or two risks would you, or opportunities would you see of disintermediation um, for the public sector in that consumer slash citizen empowerment? Over to you for the next two, three minutes. Thank you. Oh, don't hear you. I don't, we don't hear you. And I think you're saying good things. I think he was saying good things. Okay, please, please continue in the two or three minutes. Um, and then I can come to Jonathan. Thank you so much, uh, Carlos. No, nope, I don't hear you. I'm not, I'm not going to waste minutes. I'm going to let Carlos maybe speak with the tech team to fix that. And I'm going to come to Jonathan Bright, if I may, who is an associate professor and senior research fellow at the Oxford Internet Institute. What do you focus on in your work, please, Jonathan? Just briefly in 20 seconds, what's the focus of your work? And then I'll come back to Carlos. So one of the things I'm really interested in, that's why I'm here, I think, is understanding how to integrate technology uh, with local government, with city government, and uh, with national government. What happens when we bring in new technologies such as artificial intelligence? into government, how can they be used to make outcomes better for citizens? How do you see the added value of a smart city for its citizens? And if you can just extrapolate in a couple of minutes, that would be wonderful. What is that important added value? Yeah, I'll try and keep it brief and kind of top line. I see it in terms of two dimensions, uh, prediction, and personalization. So we, we heard a couple of examples already of how um, city governments can start to predict better about what's going to happen in their local environment. I mean, uh, as we were hearing earlier, you know, cities, more than 50% of the world's population live in cities. Um, they're extremely difficult to get data about. It's extremely hard to know what's going on uh, within them. And the, the wave of new technology around smart cities and artificial intelligence promises to change that a little bit. So we heard an example about predicting where rubbish is going to occur or predicting how full cities are going to be at certain times, predicting uh, crime, predicting transport usage. This type of AI technology offers the promise of this type of prediction. And if you have this prediction, then you can adjust government better and hopefully have better outcomes for citizens. So that's one prediction. Uh, Personalisation would be the other big area. What, one of the things, one of the features of government is that it's very much kind of one size fits all. One educational pathway, one health pathway for individual health conditions, a few different types of transport services, but not many in, in your local area. Government has to govern as a sort of big picture, one size fits all, because it's been very hard up until now to personalize services. But and this is another opportunity that AI brings, I think it's something that people are looking at very closely. How can we use the power of AI to make more granular decisions, more personalized decisions? And again, hopefully give people not only better outcomes, but outcomes that fit their case a little bit more specifically. 
Thank you so very much for being so concise. A quick question before I come back to Carlos and hear his answer to the question I posed. We heard there from Google talking about AI principles, scientific, ethical, and so on. We heard about, you know, um, citizens, consumers being part of those projects. Tiziana talked about it. Uh, we heard about it in Seville from our uh, police intendant that consumers were, but there is the issue of trust. You heard it, it came out of the survey. 30 seconds, sorry. How do you see that issue, people's concerns? What do we need to keep in mind to address those? It's a massive issue. Yeah. And we have to remember that in general, people don't trust government right now. It's not just about AI. There's a big trust crisis in government overall. For AI in particular, I see three elements as being critical to the trust uh, mix. Uh, one of them is control, giving people a sense of control. When people talk about privacy, they're often worried about not being in control of their data. Are they actually in control of these technologies? Another one really linked to this is about explainability. Uh, I think we see this a lot now. Artificial intelligence, which makes decisions that no one can explain, is often very hard to use in government and I think will often provoke these crises of trust. And this is a big problem because you have a very complicated machine, but you also need to explain it in relatively simple terms. But I think it has to be explainable. And then the third one is about failure. Uh, no technology exists in human society that didn't fail uh, every now and again, or indeed fail repeatedly. So you have to think about what happens when AI gets it wrong. Um, what are the systems in place to correct those mistakes and certainly not start from the point of view that it'll, it'll never fail because it undoubtedly will. Thank you so very much. I am now going to turn to Carlos. So I asked you, I said to you, look, we've got these empowered, increasingly empowered citizens, consumers. What do you see as a risk or an opportunity or both in terms of disintermediation for the public sector, for the local level? How would you articulate that? Thank, thanks, thanks, for, thanks for the question. Um, in fact, cities are networks, and everything that we are saying, the, the trust, the risk, so on, uh, it, it all based in the question of legitimacy. Okay? So we are having a disintermediation process, and the rulers and governments are intermediaries. And people don't trust intermediaries anymore because sometimes they are not needed. When you talk about public action, coercive power, we are talking about a way of solving market failures that somehow today probably they don't exist. So the question of legitimacy, the, the tax to the governments, not trusting them, relies precisely on this feeling that people by their own can create their preference in a better way and the government as the public decider. So the question here is, where is the balance of the power? Where is the power? And the balance is shifting. Sometimes in the past, the, the power was in the offer side, for example, public sector, and now is in the demand side, the consumer, the citizen. So, and this is not uh, yet explained in a, in a very clear way in the different uh, legal framework. So we have a new society, right? we have a new legal, uh, legal paradigm, we have a, no, a new social contract. And we are trying sometimes to uh, frame this new world in ancient concepts. And this is a very, uh, a, a, it's a very big danger because it can um, end in a legitimacy crisis. So the best thing to do is in fact to rediscuss and rewrite and rewrite the approach that we have on this whole concept. We cannot forget that the birth of the etymologically term politics is a government of cities. So, but the cities today are different from the cities from the past. So the, 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 the own concept of politics, it, it made me change in order to address all the, 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 the challenges everybody talked here. I like the transversal approach 
and not to the verticals. As verticals are important for the technology, but the question of the horizontal band is critical for the legitimacy. And this is something that we need also to address in, in a very broad base of concept, civil rights, data law, new ethics frameworks, everything. So we have here a, a huge challenge to, to address when we talk about AI in cities and uh, smart cities and so on. We need a new world framework of, of, of approach. Wind up, but I can't see you to do it. I'm so very sorry because I've been told that I have to really rigorously stick to the time. I wanted to come back to you, I can't. Stay with me a moment. Marco, one thing I want you to do, there are some great surveys coming out from Euroconsumers, not least one on people's attitudes to vaccination and everything around COVID. So um, just tell me, and I can't allow you more than a sentence, just highlight two that are coming up. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah, we, we, we are doing many. And when we are speaking about the ones that are in this area of interest, uh, I mentioned, okay, shared mobility in cities, uh, Internet of Things and connected consumers, uh, the, the digital world after the pandemic, which is evolving rapidly, the, the mobility included also connecting and automated mobility and behavior from the consumer side on the sustainability as well. So these are the ones that are more or less related to this, uh, to this area of interest. So we are not stopping here, basically. We will continue to monitor innovation and, and, and implications in the, in the citizens' life. Thank you so much. Can I say an absolute huge thank you to all of you? You've been brilliant. I've barely given you enough time to, to elucidate. You said so many important things around dynamic data, the use of data, AI principles, the importance of asking where is the power and how do we address that rearrangement of power when we're talking about safety issues. The importance of explainability when we use AI, um, the value of citizens' well-being for technology and the different areas where it can be of value and how it's important to bring the citizen into that decision makers, the preemptive nature of it, the prediction, the personalization. So much was said that, not least in all those areas like improving public transport, traffic, waste, and as Marco said at the beginning, could it be for missing persons? Could it be used in terms of criminal investigations? So thank you so much to all of you. I bid you a very warm farewell and you can wave to our very loyal audience who are watching us. And uh, I hope to see you for a more extended time next time for a super interesting conversation. Thank you. And I will see the audience shortly Thank for you. our next session. Thanks to you. See you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.